morning. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Abdurrahman Joe. I'm one of the core directors of the Geneva Seminar of Africa. Um, this is actually the first edition that we're having here at the Graduate Institute. I would like to just briefly thank all of the excellencies present here, all of the members of Organization of International Geneva, and all the participants in this first staging of the summit. Without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Madame Directrice Marie Lorsal, who is the director of the Geneva Graduate Institute and who will do the honor of doing the opening remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Abdu. Uh, good morning to all of you, dear students, your excellencies, dear friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome, uh, even a, a bit virtually on my part, at the Geneva Graduate Institute. I'm very sorry I cannot be with you today, but uh, I'm definitely with you in, uh, in mind for, for the entire day. I would like to start with a number of thank yous. First, I would like to thank Ms. Pamela Anguesh for delivering the keynote that will come just after me. I would also like to thank uh, Their Excellencies, Ambassador Ka, uh, representing the Gambia, Ambassador Andri, uh, representing Ghana, and Ms. Guillon, who's representing Congo today, uh, for their presence and their involvement in this uh, event. I would also like to thank the generous sponsors for these events, and you have the names uh, of all the sponsors, sponsors uh, on the program for the sake of time. I will not um, list all of them right now. I regularly say, and I would like to say it again this morning, how proud and impressed I am by our students. I am amazed by their stamina, by their motivation, their initiative, and their sense of responsibility. And the Geneva Summit on Africa 2022, 2022 uh, the first one of its type, is the result of such mobilization, such energy and sense of initiative and drive. And the program that uh, the entire team has uh, prepared for you today is extremely rich and highly stimulating. Again, you know, the only thing I'm regretting is not to be able to follow it uh, throughout the day. So first, I would like to give a big thank you uh, to Abdurrahman and Bassi, because they were the first two ones to come and pitch to me uh, this project a number of months ago. I would like to underscore their determination, even when there were obstacles on the way, and uh, uh, their desire to really push this project and see it through. So a big thank you to you both, but also a big thank you to the entire teams of both the Africa Student Association and Black Conversations, who've been very involved, all of them, in uh, the preparation for this version of, uh, of the program. So congrats for pulling this through, and I'm looking forward to getting your feedback on how it went after today. Africa is the continent and the pulse of the future. It is so in a very direct and very simple sense. It is the continent where youth is. Uh, in most African countries, we know that 70% of the population is below 30. And where there is youth, there should be hope, drive, creativity, innovation, and courage. What our world needs most is indeed uh, those things, hope, drive, creativity, innovation, and courage, because what we are in search of today, this is quite clear from everywhere we turn, is of a new paradigm. We need new solutions, and we need for that, in particular, uh, a new, more inclusive, more resource conscious, and more human-centered multilateral architecture. And I'm focusing on that here because obviously being in Geneva, being at the Geneva Graduate Institute, we are more than ever convinced that the types of issues that we are facing, the types of redefinition, paradigmatic redefinition that we are in search of will not happen by re-enclosing ourselves. It will happen through international collaboration, an international collaboration that we have to reinvent. The other thing that we have to be very conscious of is that this new solution, this new paradigm has to be human-centered, but human in the sense of a humanity anchored in a planet with rare and limited resources. And those two things are inescapably entangled. So the solutions we have to uh, deliver will have to deliver 
uh, solutions that will be by nature um, resilient and sustainable and you know obviously taking very much into account future generations building on a rich ecosystem of social practices of governance forms of cultures and perspectives on the world I believe, I strongly believe, that the African continent, through its mobilized youth, has a huge role to play to help revitalize the multilateral toolkits and through it uh, revitalize our, our new paradigm, our new solutions for the future world. And, you know, obviously, following from that, I'm convinced that our students at the Geneva Graduate Institute will have to take a huge part in this, will take a huge part in this, and for me today, this event that they are launching is only the beginning, and I'm looking forward to see how it evolves uh, later through time. So wish you all a great day. Again, sorry for not staying with you, but uh, I'm sure you'll have very interesting and rich discussions, and I'm looking forward to getting uh, the feedback of uh, how it all went. Have a great day all. Thank you so much, Madam Line Directrice. Uh, we also would like to say that we've received enormous support from the directors from the beginning um, of this whole initiative. So again, thank you so much for doing this. So now we would like to get to the keynote speech that will be given by Ms. Pamela Anguesh, um, founder of Gulu's Women Economic Development and Globalization. Um, she's a human rights defender, and she also mobilized grassroots. She's coming all the way from Uganda, and we've had the opportunity. She decided to actually extend her stay just to be part of this event. So without further ado, I would like to give her the speech and also welcome you to Geneva. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> good morning. Um, Thank you so much. I'm privileged to be here. I would like to recognize the presence of our key guests. Um, I also want to thank Mary, Director for Geneva Graduate Institute, His Excellency Ambassador Mohammed, Permanent Representative of Gambia to United Nations in Geneva. His Excellency Ambassador Emmanuel, Permanent Representative of Ghana to the United Nations offices in Geneva. Ms. Johanna, Member of Permanent Mission of Republic of Congo. Bastian Morad, Representative of Irene Swiss. Irene Swiss is one of our partners uh, that made it possible for me to be here. Organizers of this event, partners and collaborators, students, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pamela Language. I'm already been introduced. I come from Uganda, basically northern Uganda, the Pearl of Africa, my motherland. I'm happy to be here. Our team for today is for grounding Africa excellence and innovation. And I would want to draw our attention to the conference objective, which is to put forth the great stride of continent and displaying African excellence in different fields, such as heart, democracy, international taxation, health, through several innovation, also to discuss the importance of forgotten industries and also to reflect on the future of Africa. So, while I speak about Africa, I want to draw your attention to Africa Vision 2063 Agenda, which talks about a powerful Africa, both politically and economically, Peaceful Africa prospers with quality of life for its people, strengthening governance, accountability, transparency, and foundation for a peaceful Africa. An independent Africa that on its own agenda without interference of foreign powers, an intellectual investing in its African brains and high level of 
scientifically innovation that is competitive. An integrated and united Africa with one voice, inclusive and innovative. An Africa with a strong culture of identity, common heritage, shared values and ethics exercised through Pan-Africanism. An Africa whose development is peaceful and people-driven, relying on potential of African people, especially its women and youth, and caring for children, full gender equality, and all spheres of life. An Africa which has a strong, united, resilient, and influential global player and partners. Finally, when we speak about Africa, it is important to note that our rich culture endowed with beauty and nature is what all us together. However, what are the realities of the ground in different African continent? Noting that the agenda flagship has been integrated in strategies such as networking, a modality of African commodity chain and free trade, free movement and open boundaries, among others. This has been facing implementation and resource gaps. The reality is also seen through the gaps in democratic dispensation of power through democratic processes which is not uh, governed well, geopolitical risk factors, natural resource management, climate change effects. I think as we sit here, we can also remember Nigeria, what they are going through now with climate impact in terms of flood. So there is still an acute poverty with less opportunity to move towards middle-class country, mostly influence, with corruption and bad governance. And I think that we still have more to do because how are we going to ground our innovation to promote an inclusive, sustainable development in Africa? How can the Geneva Graduate Institute link current innovation to influence new partnership and development cooperation and collaboration that fosters spaces to influence linkages between African leaders and actors at the global level. I must say that the future for Africa is positive and bright. The future for African innovation and development is seen through current rapid industrialization growth. For example, African government can reach heights and become climate leaders through greening the economy and use of renewable energy, green agro industrial value chain, digital innovations, among others. Africa is undergoing digital revolution, I would say. Maybe uh, we can reflect on countries such as Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. So finally, I think that innovation and inclusive growth is required to unlock African potential. And this requires strategies that will empower everyone regardless of illiteracy level. There are many homegrown African local solutions that can be strengthened to avoid consuming only foreign product. And I want to give an example from the work that we are doing in Northern Uganda. I work with women and I have seen how we have mobilized women. And so far working with a huge groups of local grassroots who are working, about 650 women groups. But what is so important is their agency to mobilize and collective voice and working to defend each other. Of course, my innovation were not through discovery of machinery, but that of changing mindset. And I still believe in the respect for human rights and inclusive democracy and practices 
that brings in participation and representation, addressing daily violations of rights and working to promote right dividends, despite the level of state influence. People voice is a big resource. The other things that are local solutions. I want to give an example from the work that we have been doing with women grassroots to promote and reduce seed poverty. We've seen that in post-conflict environment, where humanitarian actor bring in livelihood products in the name of food security, has inflated our land with GMO product. And it is about time that our seed poverty can be addressed by promoting local indigenous seeds, that you do not need to keep buying seeds year by year. Because our land is rich, and we still believe in our indigenous innovation. So what did we do? We decided to build the Women's Seed Bank at the grassroots. And we collected over 15 different food seeds products that can be borrowed by women, and they can replant it for the next 10 years. These are all local innovation. In terms of um, enterprise, we know that building local community entrepreneurship is the best way to drive away poverty. And so much has been done in a way that we realize that our rich culture and rich community has a lot of enterprising potential to increase on our economy. Poverty is one thing that Africans need to look into to ensure that everybody thrives. So in terms of improving child and maternal health, um, we are also working to promote the local approach of what is called the wheel of good practice that enable you know, 1,000 days of monitoring a child by local mothers. And that uh, begins from the aspect of, um, at the time of antenatal care until the last end. So in, why am I bringing this? Is because I believe that strengthening local initiative using local uh, efforts can benefit the local community of Africa, rather than waiting for legislation and policies, which might take ages and years to reach the grassroots. So I believe that all of us here has very rich uh, kind of strategies that can be built through innovation and become the most discovery of African families and community, especially depending on what works. So in terms of socioeconomic transformation, innovation and scientific research, we can do a lot with youth and young people in Africa. And we can also leverage on international and regional market industrialization, information technology, among others. These are the things that African country would want to see. So through today, uh, I believe that this submit will draw the best conversation that will help in terms of promoting excellence and innovation and possibility for the team at the Institute. What I want to begin to tell you and end with my speech is that sometimes local solution is much better than something which is high level and cannot be sustained by the local African person. 
I want to thank you for listening to my brief summary of this speech, and I want to wish you the best conversation in relation to promoting excellency and innovation in Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pamela. I have to say again, we're very grateful for your presence here. But thank you so much again for reminding us that innovation doesn't only take place in the digital sphere. It's something also that we have to use whether we're talking about security or whether we would like to approach poverty. But also, it can also be used in human rights and bring about the change that we want to see in the continent. Thank you so much again for, for, for this and for reminding us also of the African 2063 vision that all of us are working toward too for a prosperous continent. Thank you again. Um, so I will probably give place for the, moderate, for the moderated TZ, but also the first panel that we're gonna have today. And this is a panel talking about youth and innovation. Um, as Pamela mentioned, youth are a big part of the continent. And today we would like to display excellence in terms of young people who have looked at their field so, so that there is a need and then push forward innovation in order to fix some of these issues on the continent. So um, if you can give us just maybe two minutes uh, before we set up the, the stage and then bring you all upstairs. But please feel free, panelists, to come forward so that we'll make the process easier. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, permit me to um, stand on existing protocols. Um, we have a wonderful panel here today that represents youth empowerment, social innovation, entrepreneurship um, that goes to the grassroots um, in Africa. Um, I would like to present in just a few words um, Benazir Hilali. Um, she's a co-founder of Axel, an award-winning startup for um, digital, developing digital solutions. Um, for IOs, UN, um, Francophonie, and Reporters Without Borders. Um, Ami Aminata Kone, uh, she is an energy, environmental policy, and development expert and director of um, NGO Environmental Africa. Um, Marie Chatal Imuniana, joining us online. Um, she uh, is the, she leads the UBA Elevate Digital Health Platform that supports um, young mothers, pregnant women, and as prospective parents. Yasin Re, um, Reskin is an Algerian Swiss lawyer who practice and uh, whose practice includes advice on litigation related to application of double taxes. Um, yeah, welcome. Is a honor to be moderating this um, wonderful panel. Um, and I'll invite you um, one after the other to make a brief statement about your wonderful job. So I'm going to start with the Yasin Reskin, please. Thank you. No, just yours. You can. Thanks to the Graduate Institute and the Summit on Africa for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here with you today because I would like to talk about something that I think can be useful, something I hope you all enjoy. I'm talking about money. Yeah, I will do my best to make some of you billionaires by the end of this presentation. We'll, we'll see. So as you heard my field is uh, tax law, international tax law, but please don't leave the room. It's not that boring. Or at least, I would say that out of the complicated, endless codes, books, regulations, sometimes great things can happen. Four years ago, I had the opportunity to participate to a research published in the African Yearbook of International Law, thanks to Mr. Ugergus, who is 
here with us today, rector of the African Institute of International Law based in Arusha. Our researches were focused on the taxation of the international coffee trade. It didn't take us long to realize that most of the profits arising from this industry was taxed in the northern countries, while most of the work to produce the coffee was performed in southern countries, many of them being located in Africa. To understand why, I need to tell you one or two things about international tax law. International tax law has one purpose that I would like to highlight. One of the goals of international tax law is to determine which country can tax a multinational enterprise. So, you see, when a company makes some profits, it must share part of it with the country where it's located. That's called income tax, corporate tax, and so on. It sounds quite simple when a company makes profits in one country. But when a company makes profit in several countries, it becomes a multinational. For instance, here in this country, in Switzerland, you have multinationals roasting and selling coffee. Part of this coffee is produced, for instance, in countries such as Ethiopia. Over there, you have the producers working under the burning sun for hours during months. Actually, it takes around nine months of hard work to grow, collect, wash, and dry the coffee beans before being able to export them. When it comes to Switzerland, it takes 20 minutes to roast the coffee and a few seconds for the barista to fill a cup before selling it to the final customer. So in my example, which country can claim taxes? Ethiopia or Switzerland? Who must pay taxes? the producers, the roaster, maybe the barista. And there you see it gets more complicated. And to answer these questions, I must take you back in the 30s here in Geneva. In 1929, the richest countries gathered within the League of Nations, and they asked themselves how to tax the incomes arising from multinationals. Well, at that time, what we call today Multinationals were mainly corporations operating between Western occupation powers and their colonies. So those colonial powers thought about where the money should go. Surprisingly, they decided it should go to themselves. To do so, they created double taxation treaty. Double taxation treaties are international agreements that determine which country can tax what? So I will synthesize one century of tax law by saying that countries can tax companies registered in their territory according to the market price. It gets a little bit technical, so I will simplify again. The market price basically represents the price allegedly freely agreed between a buyer and a seller. So when I buy my coffee here at the cafeteria, I don't think I can really negotiate, but I accept to pay four francs. To get back to my example in Ethiopia, the producers accept to be paid less than one dollar for one kilo of coffee. The problem is that I don't think the producers can negotiate either. Out of one kilo of coffee, one can make about 100 cups. So for one kilo, Switzerland can tax upon 400 Swiss francs. And for the very same kilo, Ethiopia can tax, can tax upon one franc. Even worse, actually. The one franc tax by Ethiopia is not taxed at the multinational levels, but at the producer level, because multinationals don't have registered offices in Ethiopia. Of course, those figures and my explanations are highly, highly simplified but it is to give you an idea about the scale of the inequality we're talking about. But there is a good news. The good news is that this system is coming to an end. Seven years ago, the Starbucks scandal made the headlines when reporters discovered that Starbucks 
was using international tax rules to reduce its tax burden to a minimum while making huge profits. After Starbucks, you had Google, Amazon, and many other companies that were under the spotlights for similar reasons. But I like the fact that it started with Starbucks, with the coffee industry. I like to call it a tasty irony. So in order to, to challenge the fact that corporations were totally legally avoiding to pay taxes, the Western countries, led by the OECD, started to change the rules they created. And once again, I will simplify, but the new rule is that companies must be taxed where the value is created. It's a very innovative approach if you think about it. The OECD, the Western countries, are telling us that we can free ourselves from the law of the market and the formal registration of a company in one territory. It is this bridge that the Fair Trade Tax Organization is trying to exploit in order to increase the tax revenue of agricultural producing countries. So please stay with me. We are getting close to the billions, but we're also getting a bit technical. I just need to explain the concept of value creation. This concept is very broad. Each country are invited to offer their views on what is value creation. So many Western countries are pleading that value creation should be attributed to the place of investments, where the investments are made. Why? Well, perhaps because most of those investments are made in Western countries. The bigger states are pleading for the place of consumptions, perhaps because they have the biggest markets. Every country tries to plead for a criterion that will serve its own interests. Well, our organization, the Fair Trade Tax Organization, would like to offer a new neutral criterion. Time. The time spent in every country at each step of the value chain should serve as a starting point for allocating the right to tax of each country. If you think about it, time is the only benchmark in front of which all people are finally equal. Claiming that time has the same value for each and every one of us is believing that international tax law is based on equality between the states, the companies, the workers. So I know what some of you may be thinking. You may think it's another idealistic philosophical idea. But this project could actually become very concrete. You see, countries are unable to negotiate treaties with the involving multinationals in order to determine in advance which country has the right to tax what. And actually, multinationals would not have to pay more taxes. What they pay more in southern countries, they pay less in northern countries. So for them, it's neutral from tax point of view. During those negotiations, all criterion can be taken into account. The problem is that right now, the literature, the textbooks, and the official documents only include criterion that favors industrialized northern countries. Well, at the Fair Trade Tax Organization, we believe that African countries should choose the criterion that best suits their own interests. And for African countries producing agricultural products, we believe that time should be this criterion. If you think about it, the actual tax, international tax system was created at a time when African countries were under atrocious colonial regimes. Some of them were not even considered as countries, and their citizens were not even considered as citizens. So please, let's not make the same mistake again by leaving behind the legitimate interests of the African continent. Time changed, African nations are raising, and they should do so in every aspect of the economy. And tax law is one of the most powerful tools for this. So one last word. I've heard that uh, we have some ambassadors with us today. I would like to tell you something. If you want to collect the billions owed to your countries, please come talk with me about the Fair Trade Tax Organization. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Yasin, for presenting an innovative way and solution to give back to local farmers who work so hard and they are not paid for their valuable time. And um, some of these farmers go through a lot of healthcare challenges, as we know, that they cannot pay for and they struggle with um, their families back home. Um, you raised more questions that we are going to treat as um, we move forward. But now I want to take us to um, Rwanda, where Marie Chattel is, um, where she is going to tell us about um, grassroots innovations that uh, support um, family and prospective parents. Um, Marie, please, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and welcome to Rwanda. Uh, I'm so honored, and it's a great pleasure that I'm going to talk about something that really matters the most in our life, which is maternal infant health. I would like to take this time to thank the organizers of this event, the key stakeholders, and in particular the IPMA, who have um, been one of the people who support youth to reach their goals. So, talking about the rates of maternal infants and underage mortality rate in East African region, that shows as follows. Rwanda, the maternal mortality rate is 248 per 100,000. In Uganda, it's 336 per 100,000. Tanzania is 500 per 100,000. And Kenya is 342 per 100,000, respectively. So specifically, um, sepsis, hemorrhage, hypertensive disorders, which are present preventable causes, have been identified as the cause of, of death among mothers and adolescents in Rwanda and in the region. It is also contended that teen pregnancies in the region has also increased since COVID-19 pandemic. In Uganda, 600 50,000 teen pregnancies were reported in 2020 and 2021. While in Kenya, there, is, uh, there was 40% increase in countries' monthly average. Other Eastern, in East African countries, including Rwanda, also report the same burden of teen pregnancies to have been increased at the same period. According to Tony Baker, a world, uh, world Vision Senior Advisor on Education, and Brenda Karyuki, a World Vision's uh, Regional Advocacy Director in East Africa, they reported that in East, East Africa has, has had nearly one million teen pregnancies that has been blocked uh, from re returning to school following COVID-19. So this therefore calls all key stakeholders, publics and private, including donors, partners, to come together and devise amicable strategy to mitigate this health problem. According to Emmanuel Edegoye, uh, 2022, youth innovation can help shape the future of Africa cities. It is projected that uh, 1.3 billion people will be living in African cities by 2050, and youth have the potential to find solution to the continent's vast urban challenges. One of the challenges currently for this innovative youth in urban is reproductive health. This is a barrier to development of this innovative youth. And Umuvye Elevate through the innovation has come up with a solution to reproductive youth using technology for these youth related to and use on the daily basis. According to Rwanda Demographic Health Survey, 
the increase in education for women has had a significant positive impact on decrease in maternal and infant mortality rate. On this basis, there is a need for investing in strategies that are feasible and increase the access of maternal and child health services through health, health education and improve health technology that will serve the population and promotion of technology-based platform for the vulnerable population in East Africa. This is one of the feasible strategy to increase access to health care services as it has been used to convey health messages to the majority of population during COVID-19 pandemic. So following the above notion, Umuvie Elevate, which is a health technology social enterprise, became interested in contributing to the global issues within Rwanda, but would like to expand its work to a significant outcome. Umuvie Elevate is a digitally based platform with a name to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity associated to pregnancy and childbirth and to promote maternal, newborn and child health. Mubiei Elevate intend to achieve this aim through, through creating a culturally acceptable health education and health promotion opportunities for individuals, families, community and vulnerable and underserved population in Rwanda and East Africa. In addition, we would like to, um, to have community-oriented intervention in person. It is for global health and well-being for, of the target population through the formal survey Can you hear me? Uh, through the formal survey, um, Mubie Elevate confirmed that there, is a, there was a knowledge deficit in relation to health, uh, to maternal and infant health in the local communities. To address the identifiable knowledge gap, a team of stakeholders and collaborators, including IPMA, Speak Up Africa, and others, has helped us to develop structures and teleplatform virtual space for interaction between the targeted population, clinical information, and clinical experts. This included a timely digital platform like social medias and safe spaces, and physical community engagement services that we called the B space. Through this platform, Omovie formally and informally engaged with young parents pregnant women and prospective parents and youth to provide pertinent health information for the last two years. Our impact so far, we have received testimonials on how teleplatform are helpful and accessible and timely. And so far we have educated 801, eight, over 800 people on Instagram and over 500 people on Twitter and we have empowered physically more than 100 people uh, through the B-spaces. And at least we received two to five calls per week for advices and the reassurance. As I conclude, um, I would like to share with you our wish. I would like to ask, expand this innovation for the firstly developing it further by developing a virtual learning environment that will, uh, will allow both a synchronized and unsynchronized learning for the targeted population intervention with clinical experts. A mobile-based application will be developed for self-assessment self by the targeted population for screening purposes, chat room to answer questions and uh, ask questions with the toll-free number. In addition, Mumbai Elevate intend to develop um, a mobile diagnostic uh, survey or surveillance uh, application for the use of community or health care providers who may be contacted at the community level. This application will have 
the capability of assessing, identifying, and initiating the early emergencies response to the nearest uh, health centers. That means we need to integrate on J Elevate into the existing uh, health uh, system in Rwanda. So uh, the B spaces, our community physical space, which is intended to be utilized as a form of first space uh, intervention, will synchronize activities with the B space into uh, the existing youth corners and other government uh, existing structures. In addition, uh, there will be a separate um, the B space uh, location where everyone would love uh, to receive information can come to and learn. So it is believed that all these three strategy, if implemented appropriate, appropriately using the particular uh, community-oriented approach, will have a positive impact on reducing the adverse uh, events, awareness creation, and also refer and enhancing existing private and uh, public network in relation to youth, maternal and infant health in Rwanda and in the region. We will also improve the quality of, of care that is given to these uh, people at the community level. So to further develop this idea, Mouvie Elevate intend to do to key partnership and collaboration to, to be able to, to maximize the effort of this impact. And to achieve this goal, uh, anyone would would be uh, of a great uh, place or uh, of a great uh, has a great potential to be a collaborator for this noble cause that we intend to accomplish with your support so um without further ado i would like uh, to conclude uh, by saying that if we can uh, empower youth and enable youth uh, with innovation can improve maternal health or community development. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marisha Tal, um, for presenting the great work you are doing in using digital innovation to increase access to vulnerable and underserved population. And then um, you've called for us to find ways to um, sustain this innovation in order to improve quality health access to um, different population in the wider region. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I would like to call on Aminata Kone. You can, if you want to sit or you want to come to the podium to make your presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you to the Graduate Institute and the organizers for having me today. Um, so I am a director at uh, NGO Environmental Africa. We're a young NGO founded in 2019, and I would like to share with you our approach to sustainable development. So we work with local communities to create sustainable livelihoods. So we do this in order to improve their well-being but also to ensure the health of the ecosystems that they often depend on directly. So to give some examples, we currently have three main projects in Kenya. One is in Sagara, which is a mostly agricultural region. One is on Wesini Island, which centers on the blue economy. And one is in Joroi, on Maasai land, where livestock is absolutely very important. And so in all three of these cases, the local economy is inextricably tied to the health of the local ecosystem. When I say that we work with these communities, I really don't say that lightly. This is a concept that we try and push to an extreme. We believe that communities are best able to articulate the problems that need to be defined in the first place, that need to be addressed in the first place. We also believe that the solutions are basically always present in the community already. They might be dispersed among many people, they might not be recognized as good ideas, but they are there and they just need to be unpacked. 
So what we do concretely is we draw on the African tradition of storytelling, of verbal exchange. So we go into communities, we spend a lot of time there, we visit homes, we listen to many life stories and visions for the future. And most of all, we stimulate conversation between members of the community, from local leaders to young people and everyone in between. Um, and by doing so, we can package this into a proposal for a way forward. We present this proposal, we get feedback, we hear feelings it evokes, it might spark new ideas. So we go back to the drawing board, we adapt it, we present it again, we get feedback, etc until there is a plan of action that the community uh, stands behind. This is also the stage at which we talk organization. So what organizational structure or groups are relevant to put into place for this to work if the community is going to take ownership of the project. We discuss what roles and responsibilities need to be assigned. And it's also only at this stage that we talk about the role that we will have as Environmental Africa in the project's implementation. And compared to many intervening NGOs, this might be quite a limited role or seem like a limited role. There are, of course, often questions about fundraising, but just for startup capital to get the ball rolling. And most of all, where we are asked to accompany communities is in this organizational side of things. So how do we have a functioning structure in place? How do we make sure uh, that we work together efficiently? And how do we make sure that we can keep this going in the long run? So this is a process of co-creation, but I would go even further and say that really the community designs their own sustainable development project. Our role is to facilitate. It is to kickstart something. And what we really want to do most of all is create momentum, is to leave people with a sense of I can do something, and I know what I want to do, and I know where to start. And once they start, we are there to follow. We follow up very closely. Um, we help to change course where needed. We intervene where asked. We look at what does and doesn't work. Um, and we, can, we do this for long times. Our monitoring periods are open-ended. We would much rather dedicate a lot of time and resources to very few local projects, then have many projects sort of for the sake of it and not be able to see them through in the way we would like. So in the context of this approach, it is very relevant to talk about youth. Youth is, of course, um, extremely important. Uh, we can say that Africa was partly built on the souls of young people. Think of Lumumba, think of Sankara. We can learn from these figures from the past and we can learn how to create new conditions that allow youth to contribute in a creative and an active way to tackling some of Africa's current and future issues. Uh, what we try to do is engage youth as citizen journalists or citizen scientists, or really any role that they might be interested in. And so they report to us, not just potentially on the progress of the project, but on any developments or analyses or ideas that there might be related to the community, related to the natural ecosystem. So these can be social issues, economic, cultural, biodiversity conservation, ecosystem restoration, really um, anything. Something that we're now starting to see the potential of as well regarding youth is cultural entrepreneurship. This comes, from a, this comes directly from an experience we had uh, working with a women's group called Mlilo. Uh, they were founded around a shared love for traditional music and dance and feeling like their kids weren't interested in this and so they just do it together. And one of their wishes uh, was to record their music and to organize an event where they could perform, where they could sell their music. And Kind of to our surprise, local youth got involved in organizing this, in booking studios, producing music, creating promotional material, distributing invitations, etc. And so it was really nice to see that young people were helping these mostly older women to bring traditional music and dance to a new generation. And if you look at this against the backdrop of a structural lack of jobs, we felt that maybe cultural entrepreneurship is something that is worth exploring further um, and so this is something we're, we're looking into now. 
what I'm trying to get across when I say all of this is that listening is very valuable and it's insightful. There are, of course, great people who have understood this and internalized this. Madame Angwesh's work is a, is a great example of that. But more often than not, and especially in the biggest international development players, deep listening is, is an innovation. Um, and beyond this being innovative or not, I think this is a question of dignity. It's a question of empowerment. It's a question of project ownership, of collective action. And so if there is one thing that I would really love for you to take away from this, is that there is power in asking someone where do you feel you are at right now in your life? Where would you like to go? And where do you feel I can most meaningfully help you to get there? Thank you. Thank you very much, Aminata, for um, the great work that you are doing, um, building sustainable livelihoods for people, and through community engagement, um, grassroots solutions. Um, yeah, me? Okay. Yeah, please, uh, I'm getting a message that uh, we need to speak up uh, when we are on the podium. Um, yeah, um, our voices are a bit low. Yeah, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to welcome um, Benazir Hilali and to the podium to speak. So, Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me correctly? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, thank you as well for Abdu and uh, Bessie, who was, I think is not here today. Um, I think this is so timely to discuss today about youth innovation, and especially in the context of uh, how our traditional models of governance, of how we understand democratic practices, how we want to move forward, are, are experiencing steps that are backwards. And, and it is more, it is, really interesting to have this conversation today and center it around youth because when we tend to understand why we're experiencing this back this backwards and our democracy practices youth is at the center of it and youth is at the center of it because i think that we need to see that state or state apparatus the way that we're understanding today is not necessarily as the central actor in our system and if it's not the central actor of a system, it, we need to see it in the context of the African continent and how, if it's not the center, and this is how we're understanding it, the way that we're understanding it cultivate colonial biases, but also emphasize on structural vulnerabilities that we will be really hard to try to go forward when we are trying to run after an ideal of a model that is still trying to find its own space in the Western world. So if the state apparatus is not at the center of our environment, of our system, and especially today in time of crisis, we need to see the role and influence of the other non-state actors, and especially the role of the youth. When data say that the youth across the continent comprise between 60 and 70% of the continent. And we don't need to see it as necessarily competitor, but understanding that how they can be complementary actor in this new way of doing things forward. I would like to reflect with you on the legitimacy of understanding youth as a driver of innovation and of change. Um, for me, on two points. The first one is based on my experiences working with international organizations and governments, supporting them in peace processes, mediation, and social political um, development initiatives, and how we try to create with the population and the youth bridges, but also as me, myself, as a young innovator that has been recognized as one of them by international organizations, and see first why they position is so important and crucial to take into consideration. For me, as a security and risk expert, 
it's interesting to understand their role in order to be able to navigate better in the time of uncertainties in two ways. The first one is how they help us to anticipate and assess the environment and structural vulnerabilities of our landscapes. They help us by being able to understand the situation. Today, information is, um, we have access to information in a different way, obviously with social media, with the flow of information. What we are able to not only being able to experience and understand what we're living in that context, but also comparing it to the neighbors at the regional level, at the local level, but also in, at an international level. And this flow of information is vital for analysts, but also for governors in order to understand better how and what is happening across the continent. What we're doing with our organization is we collect the date, um, we collect perceptions of the population. And we collect perceptions of young individual because we consider it as much as important as factual data. What they are considering what is happening across the continent or what is happening in their own environment is as important as understanding different expertise or secondary data that we might have collected over time to understand the same uh, situation. It's not just that it can help us to help and assess the situation, but when um, a crisis or, or a situation arise and happen, their force of mobilization is incredible. And Pamela already touched on it, and the power of mobilization in a second, and how it is um, so important to understand their influence and their role in this um, context when everything is shifting. If the state, act, if the state apparatus is not anymore at the central, their role and their influence in the way that they perceive things can ex generate new different risk drivers and, and can escalate different um, situations to uh, another way. But still, somehow, we tend to not consider their influence and their role as legitimate. And I would like to like, think a little bit on that question and maybe reverse the concept and try to understand why we do not consider youth as legitimate in our decision-making processes when we talk about governance and when we talk about time of crisis. Maybe the first question is the labelization. When we talk about youth itself, I think as much as I'm fully proud and happy, maybe, to be considered a youth. I think that youth has an issue. We are creating an homogeneous group, and we don't tend to consider the age, the uh, gender, the ethnicity, or even the professional expertise or knowledge that all these different individuals might have and can be useful. Instead, we consider them as a group, as a shadow, that, that we tend to just put them on the side, saying, oh yeah, we're working with youth. When we look at our different uh, national, regional, continental documents and protocols, um, they are the best, explaining how we need to um, mainstream the participation of the youth and make it the most involved. But still, all of our documents are paper tigers. They are not necessarily involved, and when we tend to consider them, they're still put it on the side. I was working on um, Burkina Faso judicial uh, system, and how, uh, when it was the time of um, Raka Boré, trying to organize a forum in order to like, lay the ground of a new um, society and social construct, contract, obviously, that failed with the coup in a coup, and the second coup. But at that moment, what we were trying to understand was how can we involve youth? And when we were doing some interviews and trying to um, talk to, with um, po population and experts in their own field in order to, see, to understand how they believe that this forum might be impactful, they were saying the same thing. This is just a quota number. This is not a safe space. This is just in order to check the box and being part of it. But actually, when the decision are taking place in the decision-making processes, they are still putting on the side. And their legitimacy is not just on that point. It's also that as a number, as a growing number across the continent, 
we tend to put, unfortunately, some biased narratives. And again, this narrative attempted by our past, but also can be used for political ambitions that are not necessarily in the benefit of use and what we call use. I'm talking, for example, of when we want to project the numbers of what the African continent will be in 2050, we also need to understand that these numbers, growing numbers, growing force and drivers um, of change can also represent a threat for some of us. So we need to be careful in the way that we talk about young individuals. We need to be able to like, portray their work in their own um, I don't know, I can't find my sentence. We need to like put, portray it regarding of their legitimacy, regarding of their expertise, regarding of what they can practically bring and not putting on them any assumptions. So um, thank you very much for listening to me. And I think that the main point of my conversation here in order to assess a new drivers for change and governance, and especially in time of crisis, and um, how we or young individuals can be useful is trying to understand what we can do in our own way and not necessarily putting assumptions on us. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, um, Benazir, for, um, you posed a lot of questions. You, you've, you, you are challenging the status quo, the global north-south dichotomy, and why is the global south trying to fit its own innovative model into the global north? And you, you are raising the question of why is the youth always in the shadow? Why are they not mainstreamed? Um, so, I'm going, to, I'm going to begin um, the rounds of questions now. Um, for those that are online, you can uh, post your questions and we'll um, treat them accordingly and we are going to take questions from the audience. Um, so my first question to the panelists will be um, just beginning from where Benazir stopped. It's about collaboration and building network and how do we mainstream um, youth how do we bring them to the forefront? Because every time it seems like we represent youth as um, to, to fill a gap of diversity, to say, oh, the youth is involved. So we tend to use this um, word called collaboration instead of mainstreaming their innovative ideas. Um, I'm going to begin with um, Yasin. So for me, maybe one of the key would be decentralization. Switzerland is a federal state, and uh, it's very interesting to see how the youth can have some power in the smaller communities, such, such as the municipalities, what we call the cantons, they are the small states that uh, are part of, of Switzerland. And um, what I see is that you have some youth association that can have an impact at uh, a very local level. It would be way harder for them to have the same impact in the capital, in Bern. But if you take all those small associations acting in their local level together, even if they are not coordinate, they have an impact at a federal level. So my answer would be decentralization. Thank you, Nassim. Um, Marie Chatel? Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, thank you so much for that question. For me, my answer would be empowerment and support. Uh, youth has uh, great ideas. Youth are able. And we, we always say collaborating with youth, but they have ideas down there in the community. If we can empower them, support them, that will be uh, that will be one of the the things that I think they need for now. Cause ideas are dying in the community. Cause uh, they don't know where who to approach, who to collaborate with, and sometimes uh, when they are starting up, 
like when it's a startup, then it's a challenge on its own. So I think if we can empower youth, empower their ideas, there will be mistakes. But on the other hand, they will learn much on how to, to do it better. So for me, I go with empowerment. Thank you. Thank you, Marie Chatel. So empowerment here. Diversification from Yasin Amilata. How do I turn it? No, you don't have to turn it on. Oh, I don't. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks for this question. My views are very aligned with what has been said. I very much believe in the power of the local. Um, I do think there that we need to be wary of not tokenizing youth by lumping them all together and doing one maybe focus group and we don't really know who composes it and we say that we've worked with youth. And so I would say uh, that we need a multiplication of local actors. That way you humanize people, locals, locals who, local organizations who know the youth that are involved and we need to find ways to consolidate that information um, so that we have meaningful but detailed uh, reports that we can send back to whether sponsors, uh, actors in governance. But I think it should be a bit like Yasin said, um, decentralized. I want to see a multiplication of local actors doing this work rather than one big organization trying to tick the right boxes. Um, thank you very much, Aminata. Um, Benazir, please. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I was reflecting while we were talking to our answer tonight. We say, I think it's a mix uh, between your different answers. Um, when we talk about decentralization, especially across the African continent, I think that we obviously have faced like different hurdles in putting in place um, efficient uh, instruments and mechanisms, but in the same way, the ability of assistance make it more fluid in the way that um, if the state apparatus have failed in a certain way to be able to develop across vast territories, there's been systems that are already there, and we need to acknowledge the hybridity of it and the fluidity of it. And so we need to legitimate this different presence. And so we need to legitimate the role of the youth and the population and how we can potentially collaborate to make our public services or our different um, structures and mechanisms more efficient while working with them because they're already there. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, um, Benazir. Um, you raised the question of legitimacy. We have empowerment on the table, decentralization, um, local participation. Uh, so these are tools that we need. And um, who empowers you? Who, who, who gives you the legitimacy? Do we have the legitimacy to do what we need to do? And uh, the question, the question now goes to how do we equip ourselves with the tools that we need to carry out these things that you've mentioned so far? So I'm going to start from the last speaker, <laughs> Benazi. Thanks. Um, I think it's in two ways. The first is by the fact of occupying this gray zone already, the absence of um, formal form of powers and influence there make it legitimate. But in the same way, um, youth or this group that we are talking about are not necessarily um, accepted or legitimate at the global sphere. And so maybe we need to equip them and understanding what, how they need to be equipped in order to be able to compete on this um, global level. And maybe in order to compete at this global level, and here I'm not saying competing, but I think they need to compete with the powers and, and dynamics in place. I'm saying they need to compete in terms of legitimacy and having um, a role that is accepted. Maybe there, in order to do it, they need to, or we need to better understand 
the status quo, and we need to better understand as well how the system is structured and the biases and stereotypes that are putting in place. Because it's really, and I think it's great to talk about empowerment, and I think it's great to be able to see all these different works that have been done. But if we do not necessarily talk the same language, and if we do not necessarily um, have the same understanding of expertise, then we are competing in two different grounds and in two different space. So uh, yes, it will be how we can build these bridges and trying to identify them practically, and then we can move forward. Thank you, Thank you Benazir. Um, Aminata, you want to come in here? So I think it's not so much a question of how do you make yourself legitimate, it's how are you um, perceived. It's simply deciding to see people as legitimate because they are, because they live somewhere, because they are affected by the issues that you're talking about, that you're trying to address. Um, the, the opinions count. So I think the equipping is not so much a question of what do we do ourselves, it's more a choice, especially on the part of the big development donors, where I truly think that some more humility um, would be good. Instead of saying, we are going to implement projects, it's saying, we are going to support many, many, many local projects that might have different approaches, but those approaches were developed by talking to youth locally and by listening to what people want, what people think is best for themselves and their community. And that is where our role stops, because we have resources, they don't, but what they want, what they do is legitimate just because they live there, <laughs> that is really enough. Um, and I think it's as simple as that. It's really a choice that is made in, in places like, like this very city. Thank you, Aminata. Um, the question of um, local initiative being um, driving this legitimacy. Um, Marie Chatel, if you are still with us, do you want to come in? Thank you so much. Uh, I think what they have said, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I second their ideas because if we are if we are to to bring up youth, we need to we need to work with them. So one thing that maybe I I can add on is to engage youth in policy making. Cause uh, they are they are going they are the next generation. They are the next leaders. They are they are the next. Um, uh, police makers, they are the next uh, big leaders of, of the government. So if we can engage them in, in policy making, I think that will be uh, uh, an added value for whatever we will do to empower them. Thank you. Thank you, Marie Chatel. Um, Yasin? I believe, uh, I believe in that uh, civil society is extremely powerful, even in uh, autocratic regimes. Uh, Victor Hugo once said something like, uh, the people are like water, they crush themselves against stone, but at the end of the day, water wins. Um, it was something like that. Um, I think that the, the youth can not only by participating to a great project or, or not even by participating to, to politics, but by choosing the way they live, they are changing the society. The way they consume, the choices they make day to day, by this simple uh, act of life, they have an enormous power. And then of course, it's, uh, it's even better if this enormous power reflects in politics and in, in uh, the, the decision-making process. But I don't, I'm not sure that it can be controlled, actually. I think uh, we can try to, to give some indication about how to proceed, but things just uh, happen by themselves, by the, the power of, um, of this civil society that has this power just because it exists, because 
you have all these young people choosing new way of, of living, of consuming, and I think this could, uh, could change more than any great political project. Thank you very much, uh, Yasin, for that insight. And thank you for your responses. We are going to engage the audience now. If we have a... Okay. Would you like to take all the questions first, or would you like to take them one after the other? One after um, <clears throat> thank you so much for giving me the opportunity again, and because I like the youth so much. So when we talk about youth, um, there are certain things that I had wanted you to probably tell us how you want this done. Um, in terms of governance, um, in terms of civil society engagement, in where I come from, the civil society is facing a lot of shrinking spaces, and the youth are seen as threat to every uh, development. There is already a pooling of power because we seem to have the highest population of youth and young people, and the youth engagement and, and, and movement and mobilizing seem to be a threat. So we also need to link the youth conversation with political dispensation for them to take over powers and make decisions for themselves. Um, I wanted to, to, to ask uh, Mr. Mani, the one who talked about tax. Um, <clears throat> especially uh, the problem is sometimes not just the empowerment, it's the access to resources and market and the question should be, who is holding this power? Why can't you sell freely? In some situations, the youths are given skills, opportunity. You talk about coffee. In my own country, we grow coffee a lot. And young people seem to be having access to grow coffee. But what is happening with market in terms of when it comes to Import, export is not for everybody. There's a specific group of people that in, investor comes. The latest uh, story with Uganda you should have heard, where only one investor is supposed to buy all the coffee from the country. You're not supposed to sell to anybody else. So access to market and opportunity is one burning issue for youth and young people. How do you anticipate and want us to change the way we do things? Maybe there is other option. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the great questions. I think we take the question on um, the shrinking space for the civil society, then we'll go to the access to markets and um, with Yasin. So we start with the shrinking um, civil society spaces. So anyone can start. Thanks for the question. And I think that what's happening as well in Uganda um, with uh, young opposition leaders as well that are trying to compete and also like propose alternatives is uh, crucial and we need to like understanding more as well. Um, it's not just in Uganda, it's everywhere. How do space or say space uh, for political engagement is shrinking? And it's not just shrinking, it's overlooked. And it might, we might feel like it still exists and we might feel it's growing and we might feel uh, more and more conversations happening on the side of big events, but still other recommendations taking into account. So um, I don't know how much if, how this is a question, but for me it is more like a, as a fact. And uh, we need to understand why and we need to understand how. Um, and for me, how are we talking about it and why is because we are still not taken seriously and our expertise, our um, experience of living or our field expertise and knowledge is not taken into consideration. But in the same time, when we talk about youth, and that's why I was um, trying to explain when I was talking about the differentiation between age and ethnicity, who are we talking about and how old are they? Because when we look at the people that are now doing the coup right now, are they considering our youth? 
And so if yes, should we question what also uh, this means for our growing population and, um, the, and the backward of democracy as well? So yeah, thanks. Um, perhaps I don't mean to sound like a broken record, um, but I take it back to the local because a lot of the times this pressure, this shrinking space, these threats are um, in many ways at the regional or national level where it is very visible, where the threat perceived by the powers that be is largest. And so as youth, as people active in civil society, this is not only discouraging because you feel like your efforts might not be paying off, uh, and there's pushback, but it can also be dangerous even, sometimes with people fearing for their lives. And I truly believe very deeply in the multiplication of efforts on a small scale. And I think there are benefits to saying, maybe we're gonna scale back a little bit and focus on a smaller geographical perimeter. Because when you do that, when you start there, always with the objective of large scale change, obviously, um, but when you start there, you see results faster. It can be energizing and revitalizing to keep going. And if we do see this happening in many, many, many places at the same time, then something will shift. And like Yasin said as well, all these uh, small efforts, they add up. They um, sort of lead to change that might not even be really perceived. That is just through a change in how things are done in how we consume, in what we choose to produce, in the uh, where we choose to sell our products to or buy our products from. Um, and so to me, this is the, in a way, the sa safest route to go if you feel that on the national level you're not booking results and your work is even uh, threatened, but you still want to keep going. Maybe a few comments about uh, the market. Um, there is no free market. The market is not free. You cannot decently go to a producer and tell him, look, I cannot pay you enough for you to leave because, hey, that's the market, that's the stock exchange in London or New York, free market, sorry. No, that's not possible anymore. And uh, actually, tax law enables countries to free themselves from those old laws of the market. I can give you an example. When you pay something with your credit cards, most of you, part of the money that MasterCard make goes to India. MasterCard doesn't have any offices in India, but India was able to plead successfully that the computer databases used by MasterCard to enable the transaction, transaction process uh, was part of the value creation of uh, the company called MasterCard. It's a very famous um, um, ruling in India. And now because of that, because of this political will, India is able to collect part of the, the tax owed by uh, MasterCard. I think it, it's time for the African countries to consider those possibilities and to realize that the old laws of the market are being changed but by the one who made them, put them in places, the Western countries. And there is a huge opportunity to free, not the producer yet, but at least to start by freeing the countries from the laws of markets. I'd like to just, I'd like to just add two words about the access to marketing. I think here it's very interesting to look at digital innovations and the potential of digital. You know, even in the West, uh, online technology has really revolutionized what people can do and made producers much more autonomous. Think of Etsy and web shops through Instagram, etc. Um, and I have an example uh, of this in Kenya, where in Joroi, um, the women make really beautiful jewelry, uh, bracelets, etc., that the Maasai are known for. And uh, they had thought of selling this, but the, low, the nearest market is quite far, and they just do not have the time to do that between the family and tending to the livestock, etc. And so they just abandoned this idea. And we connected them to this web shop called South Africa that's trying to sell, well, that's not trying to, that sells um, African, um, 
crafts, uh, etc., across the world um, with direct ties to local producers. And so they have been inserted into that value chain where slippers sold all over the African continent are sent to them first to decorate with their beadwork and then sold on and obviously they get paid for their work. So it's just one example of how uh, the digital sphere, I think, can help with access to market, even if it's sometimes starts small. Um, about uh, the digital sphere, I would like to add something. There are no um, discussions about how to tax those digital giants because they actually benefit from the use of their services uh, around the world. So the initiative came from um, European countries, France and uh, Germany, but it could also benefit African countries. And you have uh, discussions that are quite advanced at the OECD levels, but once again, the OECD only represents its member. It's uh, the G20, but it's led by the G7. So once again, Africa should, should come to the table of, uh, of negotiation. And just quickly as well on that point, on how uh, European regulations as well can um, support the African continent for the um, market, but also to making sure that the people are, not, are uh, able to work in dignity is also the new regulation on the directive DDHR that's been done regarding the human rights and the ESG for the supply chain. When we know that like the 40th, 50th year of the suppliers are uh, for some of them based on the African continent and how um, the big corporates might be um, fine if they do not respect necessarily the human rights regulations and ESG regulations at that lower tier. I think this might be as well a um, levier that we can potentially play on in order to make sure that our workers at a local level are taking great care and they uh, legitimacy and the way that they work is um, sustained in that way. Marie Chatel, I don't know if you want to join the conversation. Yeah, um, I'd like to add a little bit on the first question. Um, I believe uh, when the, the leadership of the country supports youth, then everything is possible. Whatever we are, say, we are talking about uh, right now, could be possible if the the leaders of the of the countries African countries could understand how youth are not a threat, rather uh, if they are given opportunities can even uh, play a big role in improving all development of the country. Um, I. Uh, I'm so privileged to, to, to be a Rwandan and to come from Rwanda where youth are empowered, are given opportunities, and it's easy for youth to, to reach the market because they are supported by the government. And I, I, I would like to call other African countries to take this uh, as something that is so important in uh, development of the country because I've seen development uh, in, in, in this country since when the youth has been engaged into police making and when youth has been given opportunities to, to, to bring up their ideas into life. And also uh, I've seen a, a lot of uh, development since the time when youth has been given opportunities to reach the market, not only local market, but uh, even uh, at the global market. So uh, we are not there yet, but I believe if uh, African leaders and other uh, police makers could understand that youth are not a threat, rather an opportunity to reach far as a, as a, as a continent, uh, I think it would be a great message uh, for them to take and to work on uh, from today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie Chatel. Great responses from the panelists. Um, I'm just going to take 
um, two questions, very short, and I would expect short responses from the panelists too. So I think we had a hand up here before. And Hello, um, thank you so much for such a lovely panel. Um, I just have a quick, so we're talking a lot about youth empowerment and accountability in terms of kind of the youth recognizing themselves as you know necessary actors within these various spaces. But I kind of wanted to shift the ownership potentially and the question towards the institutions themselves, specifically international organizations and large international organizations and financial institutions at the World Bank, for example, emerging talent on average is age 45. And so I'm wondering from our perspective, how can we, but also how can international institutions take accountability and structurally making these kinds of situations more accessible um, in kind of a realistic way? And then beyond that, how can we talk about the fact that even accessibility is gatekept? So the fact that we attend a private university which gives us access to spaces like the World Bank, or the fact that a lot of us have come from universities within certain locations gives us privilege to those spaces too. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, great question. Um, so it's a question of how again. The system, it was mentioned, and I'll start from my left all the way to the Rwanda. So, Aminata, please. Um, I think that's a super important question, thank you. I also think it's a very difficult one. Um, because we're talking about big organizations, and big organizations are hard to change. So part of this comes down to willingness. Um, that's step one, is recognizing the problem. I think there are many, uh, both internally, like the example you mentioned, and externally in the work they do, even in the criteria used to monitor and, evaluation, uh, and evaluate the effectiveness of their work. So there needs to be a recognition of the problem, then there needs to be a choice to address it, and then there needs, a whole, needs to be a whole process of putting that into place. And when we're talking about such big organizations, I think, and, and structural issues, I think this is only something, unfortunately, that's going to take time. Um, some things are maybe easier to change than others. Hiring policies are very important, criteria. I think that even beyond the, the, the sphere that we're talking about, um, you know, the privilege of going to certain universities is something very um, t toxic in a way. Um, and I think there are small steps that can be taken in that regard, but the leadership needs to be willing. Uh, and with time, hopefully, if those things are changed, leadership will change as well, values will change, and that can speed up processes of real transformation. Personally, I don't think those uh, big organizations you're mentioning are here to offer free lunches. So, you know, when they offer their help, it's uh, not free. And uh, usually they ask the countries to change some regulations, and sometimes there is a political agenda. Maybe it's a good one, I don't know, but there is a political agenda. So it questions the notion of independence for the countries accepting this so-called help. That's why um, I prefer the fact that African countries and all the countries actually can be autonomous and can collect their own taxes, have their own money, and, and defend their independence. So to answer you can, to your question, I, I'm not sure those organizations can really do something or at least they won't do it for free. Thank you. If we touch the subject of aid, we're not going to leave. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to touch it. Uh, but I think there is a lot to, to, to say there, and there's a lot of, um, uh, obviously, um, issues and structural issues, but this is for another conversation. In terms of our own processes in, in international organization, I think this is such an interesting conversation as um, as a mid-career professional, but also as an employer myself, and how I'm facing the same issue when I'm trying to hire from diversity, and uh, I can see how it is really out to just have candidates that are willing to um, just apply, um, and, and why it is so. I was having a conversation actually yesterday with a university that has 70% of their graduate from a BME background, and I wanted to 
to talk with, with them and say, how can we partner with you in order to make sure that although we're coming from prestigious university, I also want to make sure as an employer that I can give access to um, job offer that can also be accessible for, to the to other candidates. And maybe the key is there is at the university level. And when we look at the university across the African continent, there's not that much partnership with um, uh, France or here or uh, UK where I'm based. And there's also like um, an issue between university across the continent that they don't necessarily collaborate between each other. We created a network of 20 universities to gather our data. And we realized that there is a massive divide between the francophone space and the anglophone space. They don't really talk to each other and they don't really necessarily share their expertise and they don't either share their certification and qualification between themselves. So if between uh, the continent itself we have these uh, challenges and the hurdles, I think it would be so complicated and then to promote diversity when uh, there is no real um, represent representativity and certification that are equal. So, there is so much to, to be done there. I am not a believer, uh, and that might be a bit, pro um, sorry to say that, in quota and in affirmative actions. Um, I saw it, and, and sometimes we might open the door to some, but I'm not sure that the door um, is still open afterwards. So we need to find other ways to do it. DEI and the way that we need to like improve DEI in our recruiting system at the international level is a way to do it. But still, if there's some issues and um, we saw it, and I'm sure that some others are experiencing it, toxic masculinity or harassment in international organization, how are they taken into account and how are they addressed when we are young people um, uh, suffering from them? I'm not sure. That I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, um, panelists. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. We are over time. Um, please, a round of applause for our great panelists. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So I think we have to move on to the next, um, the fire chat debate. Yeah, please. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I think this is a great segue, actually, to the next five side chat that we'll have and talk about how we can actually create an environment on the continent that is enabling for innovation. So I would like to invite um, Ruben, who's a Graduate Institute alumni, who will be having a conversation with His Excellency, Ambassador Mohamed Duka, who's the permanent representative of the Gambia to the United Nations offices. So please make your way to the, to the stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone, um, and uh, welcome, uh, Professor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, as we have the fireside chat with Professor uh, uh, Mohamedou uh, Ka. Welcome very much. Um, as Abdul has mentioned, my name is Ruben, uh, an alumni of the Institute, but also now back as a student uh, uh, doing a PhD in international economics. And it's amazing the kind of conversations we are having here. I think um, since we started, we've had a lot of uh, interesting themes around many things, which I will not uh, try to belabor. Uh, but I think what has been you know, very interesting as I listened uh, is hearing some convergence uh, going around, uh, around solutions, uh, which is great, uh, not blabbing so much on what the problems are 
but also around the issue of localization and taking ownership um, for Africa and by Africans. And um, uh, for this particular fireside chat, we'll be speaking about um, the topic of um, excellence and innovation. And uh, 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 Professor and Ambassador will really help us uh, to think about uh, how to nurture and support uh, the next generation of African uh, uh, innovators uh, as we think around the topic of uh, uh, innovation. So I'm going to do a brief intro and then I will introduce our professor to give us some remarks and then we can go on to um, hearing some questions and having a discussion. So uh, His Excellency Ambassador Professor uh, Muhammad Duka is the Ambassador of the Republic of the Gambia to the Swiss Confederation and the Permanent Rep to the UN Office in Geneva, the WTO, and other international organizations in Geneva. In the past, he has served as the chairman of the Africa Group of Ambassadors in Geneva from 2021 to 2022. And currently, he is the Vice President Africa at the United Nations Human Rights Council. He's also the Vice Chair for the UNCTAD Commission on Science and Technology Development, and also an advisory board member of the UNCTAD Trade and Development Bureau advisory body. He's also one of the two ambassadors uh, designated as friends of the chair of the World Intellectual Property Organization WIPO General Assembly and serves as one of the vice chairs of the General Assembly of the WIPO. Proud to coming to Geneva and his appointment, he served as the founding chair of Zenith Bank in the Gambia and the chair of the board of directors at Africa Consulting and Trade Group in Dakar, Senegal. He's a board member of so many organizations, which if I enumerate, we will probably cover half the session. So you will excuse me to uh, not to enumerate them, but quite a very uh, impressive profile. Uh, prior to his diplomatic duties, uh, he served as the first Gambian born, uh, third vice chancellor of the University of the Gambia and prior to becoming <clears throat> the university vice chancellor, he was in Nigeria where he was the founding dean of the School of IT and Computing at the American University of Nigeria. He has had a very colorful teaching and leadership uh, career, teaching in the US, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Gulf countries, and in Eastern Europe. He's a regular contributor to publications and has written several papers which have been published. Um, he holds a BSc and MSc and a PhD at the Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey, and also holds a Master's of Science in Finance, Finance and Engineering from George Washington University, and also a postgraduate diploma in Strategy and Innovation from the Said Business School. So it's a good pleasure to have uh, Professor and Ambassador with us, and please help me to welcome him to give his opening remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, with that, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> um, I. I I wanted to just give a backdrop of um, some of the thoughts I was jotting down before I joined you here this morning, and I listened attentively to the very insightful exchanges earlier. One of the things that I wanted to say is innovation facilitates new solutions with transformation ability to accelerate impact. Innovation in my view, is, key, is a key differentiating feature that defines long-term sustainable impact. And the underlying word for me is sustainability, especially when it relates to our continent, Africa, and the global south. Transformative approaches to accelerate the attainment of national, community, regional, 
and global targets, such as the SDGs. In my view, we can only attain and accelerate the SDGs through innovation, but not only innovation broadly, but frugality of innovation in our context. So it is important for us to harness regional, national, community assets, some of them indigenous knowledge, uh, to harness what we've had earlier, which is the demographic dividend that is abundance in our continents and our countries. And the last point was one of the panelists mentioned the rising centrality of digital transformation. Um, it provides us with lots of opportunities, but again, lots of challenges in the innovation space, but one that must be taken as a priority as part of harnessing these regional assets and platforms. Uh, on the digital transformation and linking it to innovation, the centrality of access, affordability, adaptability, and provision of quality solutions. Innovation, if appropriately managed, it, in my mind, can reduce inequity gaps and also facilitate increased access to essential services as well as opportunities. Um, it also facilitates for our countries, if we are responsible with it, to ensure that we do not incur the cost that the countries of the North would incur in the innovation space. We often hear leapfrogging. It is true that we can truly leapfrog and lower sunk cost relating to existing infrastructure. So for Africa and the global South, um, we also have an opportunity in the innovation space which the North do not have, which is in the space of our countries, we are less structured when it comes to the regulatory environment, which we can exploit to quickly deploy innovative solutions for immediate impacts. So there is a lot of importance that innovation can bring for us. For Africa, in my view, what I want to submit to you is innovation for development with opportunities to provide sustainability and impactful solutions to rising issues that our continent and the global south continue to be confronted with. Um, most of our countries are far behind in attaining the SDGs. And I believe digital and innovation and emerging technologies can get us there. The high disease burden and epidemiology transactions across our countries can also benefit from the priority and application of innovations. Today's world, food insecurity is a reality. It provides an opportunity for our continent in the innovation space. Innovation to poverty. We know from statistics that over 390 million Africans are living in extreme poverty. So for us, innovation must connect to the poverty question. In few days in Egypt, in Sharm el Sheikh, COP27, is hosted for the first time in the continent. And of course, on top of the agenda will be climate change. Climate change is devastating our continent and livelihoods. Climate mitigation, adaptation, even financing can only take root with innovative mechanisms and strategies and processes. We also know that the rural urban inequity and divide and the densities 
numbers of our rural and urban will challenge livelihoods and productivity and productive capacities and only through innovation we can address these things. We have a highly youthful population as we had from the other panel with enormous creativity and talent. That creativity and talent can only be harnessed through various mechanisms that can trigger utilization and scaling up of innovations and creating an innovative environment for the youth and women. The application, the tremendous opportunities and application of innovative, especially digital innovation in health, in agriculture, in education, in the delivery of services, in process innovation provides enormous opportunities. Rewarding excellence across our continent will be key and essential to truly harness the scaling up and the growing innovations that is happening um, across Africa. Hubs of dissemination of refined and practical knowledge assets and improved processes to a diversity of ecosystems and value chains to improve the qualities of lives that can create value and create wealth, in my mind, is also essential. So the key to harness this importance of innovation is for our countries to truly put in place a functional ecosystem approach to enable us to foster innovation at the community, municipal, national, and regional levels, and also to build R&D leadership, an environment that will support vibrant research culture in our countries in the medium and the long term. We don't want to be in non-value creating innovation. We want innovation that can create products and services that can be scaled and used and not be dubbed an African innovation. Innovation in our mind must be placed and situated in the right ecosystem that can push quality and that can scale. Now, the readiness of our continent to truly be a player in a scale-up manner is the question. Um, so how do we connect rising African innovators to opportunities, to collaborative mechanisms, to partnerships among themselves in country, in region, south to south, north to south, will reinvigorate the innovation culture and harness the unique inputs to the innovation systems of the world. Some of the inputs that are important are the right institutions, academic, research institutions, innovators, startup, uh, the, start, the rising startups across Africa, accelerators, and venture capitals and how to channel that to the emergence of the drivers of a thriving innovation which is truly youthful and woman. Um, human capital. You can't truly innovate if our education systems, the whole continuum doesn't have the right delivery mechanisms and infrastructure to harness the future innovators and also connect them to the larger innovative ecosystems in the country. So human capital and skill development for the necessary competent workforce that are needed for the products and services that are created by innovators and for scaling up the number of innovators in various areas 
that are central to development for our countries that I mentioned earlier. So the, 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 the producer versus consumer can only be tilted to value the more we can scale quality innovators. Again, infrastructure. And infrastructure here, for me, data and digital infrastructure. We often talk about digital infrastructure, but increasingly data infrastructure must be pursued. We have abundance of data. And in the, in the evolving, innovative continuum of the world today, data is central. The emerging technologies of the world uh, can't have enough data. You can truly harness artificial intelligence or machine learning or IOTs or blockchains with quality data, with the capacity and the capabilities to be able to demystify data and channel them and use them appropriately to address local, regional, community, and global challenges. So we can't underestimate the importance of, de of decoupling, de decoupling infrastructure and know that infrastructure is data and digital and people-centric. Um, so also inclusivity. We talk about inclusivity, we talk about digital inclusivity. You can truly innovate if we have a digital divide across Africa, we have connectivity challenges where billions of people have not been connected in the world and millions and millions of youths can't have connectivity. And it's not enough just to be connected. We have to be connected meaningfully with ubiquitous, secure, resilient, and adequate broadband connectivity so that in the digital space innovation, we will begin to see access and use of high performance computing, supercomputing, so that our youths can truly create and have the necessary skills. Lastly, which I had when I was sitting at the back, somebody touched on markets, access to markets. Um, market sophistication in my mind is very important. Uh, the market dynamics must not be underestimated. The competitiveness and monopolistic structures of markets in our countries must be in our mind for us to unravel the opportunities that our young innovators are driving. And one of the audience members have signaled some of the challenges that some of the innovators continue to have in our countries, even the countries that tend to be doing well in the innovation index um, of, the, of the World Intellectual Property Organization. In addition to market sophistication, business sophistication is also very important in the innovation. The quality of business networks, and I also had some of the panel members talked about supply chains. Supply chains are essential. Intra-supply chains within the country, most of them are not um, efficient enough or functional enough to support the rising innovation ecosystems and their, their productions and their services. So um, how we build these innovation ecosystems to connect to value chains and global value chains and regional value chains are essential and connected to the market question. Um, the linkages are also very important. And I will also end by saying the outputs of innovation are as important as the inputs. The quality of the outputs, the quality of the knowledge assets, and the technology outputs, and the creative outputs are equally important, and the centrality of intellectual property and culture of intellectual property to create patents, to create value-driven patents, and the different intellectual properties, copyrights, trademarks, etc. these all need to be disciplined for them to be seen as central to the quality of innovations that Africa needs. 
and how on the financing side, how we can access sustainable, innovative financing mechanisms. And one of the emerging ideas is how to use intangible assets in the, for an IP regimes to fund innovators' creations to move to SMEs and MSMEs. Um, I have a lot to say, but I, I thought that I will just um, uh, share this humble backdrop of ideas. It's a very big topic, and, and I will be very happy to, to answer questions and, and to have sideways chat, chat, uh, chats. It's, a, it's an area I'm very, very passionate about, and it's an area that I feel is the future of our continent and the future of our youths. If we look at in the north, the drivers of thriving value creation and wealth creation is innovation. And at the, at the top of that is youthful. So how do we prepare Africa's young and Africa's women to ensure that we do not leave them behind, but we create the right elements and ingredients so that it's not just a hobby or a sport. And I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ambassador and Professor. I think uh, that was uh, very enlightening. And before I open the, you know, uh, the floor to some questions, um, I see a lot of, um, uh, maybe I'll say convergence uh, between what uh, Madam Pamela uh, mentioned in her keynote, especially around three things. Um, one is around, uh, she talked so much about green growth and you've mentioned about the issue of sustainability and how we have to you know, make, you know, make sure that the growth we want to do and the innovation is sustainable. Um, uh, she had also mentioned about you know, inclusive growth and you've brought in the issue of, about inclusivity and also like the inequality and inequity that we are seeing on the continent. And I think you know, the, the last area of convergence is around innovation. She mentioned with her work and you've, you've, you've really explained in detail so I'll just ask two questions, you know, off script, because I think you, you've already covered a lot of what we would have discussed. Um, is given, given the landscape as we see it in your work on the continent, um, wh what are some of the things that you think, you know, we are, we are doing wrong? <laughs> because it's very easy to say we need to do this, we need to do this. The question is like, are there things you think we need to stop doing? Um, and then I think the second question, just to tie them together, you know, given your experience, you know, private sector, I've seen, you know, like your work with Zenith Bank, I've worked with them, but in Nigeria, and, and seeing you've also worked in academia to the level of vice chancellor, and now you're in the diplomatic community. How, 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 do you, how can we achieve fluidity between like, you know, all these sectors and make sure what we are doing, say, at the Graduate Institute being an academic institution, actually has a role to play in the private sector or in international organizations. So it would be very nice to hear what we need to stop doing and how to achieve that level of fluidity in terms of um, innovation. Thank you so much. Um, oh, there's so many things that <laughs> we, we must stop doing, which is, but I will lump them all it, um, to playing politics and, and lip service to um, to aspects of humanity that uh, is central to human survivability and human livelihood. Um, we tend to play politics on science and innovation which ought not to be. Uh, most countries, especially in Africa, have targets, percentages that they commit to. Uh, we will spend X percent of our GDP in STI or in education. But the reality is if you look at this, the, the data, it points the other direction that we're not doing enough of. That ought to change. Um, the lack of mindfulness of listening to the youth, who are the creators? who have the ideas and also 
non-inclusivity of policies. Our policy regimes are not as smart and as inclusive as it ought to be. Um, if you look at the digital space, we've been talking about digital divide for as long as I can remember. We've been talking about connecting the unconnected for as long as I can remember. But are we doing them meaningfully? So we ought to stop the rhetoric and do things meaningfully. When we say digital inclusivity, we have to look at it from a very holistic point of view. It's not only addressing one aspect of humanity, meaning youth and women, which is important, is a priority, but you have the disabled, you have the marginalized and the vulnerable, you have uh, uh, the physically challenged in our society who are often forgotten when we say we are going to solve these through digital divide or through social or digital inclusivity. Um, if we think for a moment, uh, the opportunities, if we truly look at this holistically, that these innovations, if they are accessible, affordable, and adaptable, and truly reaches people meaningfully, how it will transform and uplift their lives. If you think of Professor Stephen Hawkins, the, 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 the known genius of physics, of particle physics, and you think of if he didn't benefit from emerging technologies, what we would have lost of his humanity and his brilliance. And you can also imagine how many people are wasting away when if inclusivity was truly holistic in the application and access and use and affordability and adaptability of many innovations, whether it is in health or otherwise, how livelihoods would have changed. A few days ago, I attended um, the robotics competition here, and I thank um, Switzerland for um, its leadership in that space, and see over 180-something member states across the world, youths, competing with robots. And you can see the zeal of collaboration, the zeal of partnership, how, um, how their innovation is extracted, and you can just see the future of the opportunity and future drivers of innovation. So if we take that simple example and infuse it into the ecosystem where robotics are affordable, accessible, usable by the, by the boy or girl in the remotest village across Africa, you can imagine how that can tickle the imagination of that young person to begin to look at local, contextualized realities that needs to be solved, and that person growing with that mindset, what innovations and creations that person will offer to their communities. I can go on and on, but there's a lot we're not doing right. We're not doing education right. Most of the education um, ecosystem across Africa and the global south literally collapsed. You can't smell science in our high schools and universities. You can't find teachers who can um, uh, 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 excite the young people to be attracted to sciences. And how are we going to be at the production side and the value creating continuum of innovation if we can truly scale the number of young scientists and emerging scientists. The outliers that we produce, we, frustrated, we frustrate them. What do they do? They go to the other world and we lose. So we're not doing things right in the elements needed to truly build a smartened ecosystem with the right smart policy regimes that can harness the opportunities in country, and also pool those that we have lost, who are trailblazing across the world as diaspora to link in building our innovation systems and ecosystems. Thank you.
thank you very much. Um, I'll allow you to comment briefly on the issue about fluidity between industry and, and academia. But before you do that, I just want to check if there is a burning question in the audience, and then we can just, so I don't limit anyone because of time. Um, if anyone has a, yeah, I think there's a question there. So we'll take that question. Um, and then we'll combine it, Professor, with a question on how to be fluid between what's happening in academia and what's happening in industry. And then uh, you'll please bear with us because of time, and then we are going to close uh, the session. Uh, please tell us your name and your affiliation, please. Hello, Nash Sabanimpa from Vision Asset Management. Thank you very much for this very engaging um, chat. Uh, dear Ambassador, I've got a quick question concerning capital. Access to capital for uh, young entrepreneurs and startups. What I've seen is that even the startups in Africa are now relocating and re-registering their companies in places like Delaware in order to attract VCs. How can we retain them in Africa and create an environment where you can create a company and actually attract VC and capital? Uh, into those startups. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just quickly, I, that's a very, very important question because um, science and innovation cost money. Um, and you can do that by re-architecting the financial value chain and ecosystem in our countries. Access to credit, the cost of credit is too high. But of course, there are macro and microeconomic realities that creates that. So the entire government machinery and processes and policies needs to be tamed. Um, better policy regimes, better discipline of the actors and agents across our governments with financial discipline can begin to enable the financial architecture to be able to reduce the cost of capital. I will also say that policy regimes are very, very important. And also government intervention. The government needs to be mindful that it's not a cost, it's actually an investment to create funding mechanisms that are sustainable, that are innovative, targeting innovative youths and other actors and agents who are in that space addressing challenges that have potential and not fear of loss or of failure. So R&D is very important, funding it, having government funding science, government funding startups, government funding creation, government funding creativity, the diaspora who are outside, who are opportune to come back to the continent and create the culture of access to capital. Um, collaboration with multilateral organizations and funding agencies that can channel support to our governments, technical assistance, but targeted to creation targeted to youth of proven concepts that can be evidence that have potential to scale. If 90% fail, it's okay. So our mindsets have to, have to, have to be shifted. It's not an easy um, answer, but through partnership, through collaboration, through private sector, through removing the barriers of, 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 of investment, and also create the market situation so that access to capital can be seamless, but more importantly, government creating funds and grants that are easily accessible by competent youth in this space. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for, for those uh, insights. Uh, as you can tell, he's very passionate about this topic, and uh, I'm sure we can catch him uh, during the lunch break. Uh, but in the interest of time, allow us uh, to stop here. And thanks so much for the organizers for, uh, for organizing uh, this particular topic and session uh, to be part of the summit. Please uh, join me in thanking uh, Professor Muhammad Duka. Thank you.